All right. So uh, here, thank you for the introduction. I'll be presenting on uh, non-contact thermoacoustic imaging of tissue with airborne ultrasound detection. Now, uh, in the imaging field, uh, one highly desirable uh, ability is to do non-contact imaging. This is where the, the instrument uh, or the sensor has some standoff distance uh, from the patient in the case of medical imaging and doesn't actually need to make any contact. Uh, this will speed up point of care, be less invasive uh, for patients, uh, be more convenient. Um, and it's, it's a difficult problem in its own right, uh, in addition to imaging of tissue has its own challenges as well. Now, traditional imaging techniques uh, are, are insufficient for the entire non-contact uh, tissue imaging uh, that we'd like to do all in some way. Acoustic mechanical methods require some kind of contact uh, with the target. Uh, we have microwave optical methods are um, they have a, a coupling between their frequency and their, their bandwidth or resolution, as well as uh, frequency, uh, a trade-off between resolution and penetration depth. Uh, other systems that, uh, you know, give good contrast and, and good imaging, such as MRI maybe, will also be large and bulky, uh, expensive, and uh, not easily portable. So if we focus on two of these existing uh, imaging techniques, we look at microwave imaging has good dielectric contrast. Um, you know, the uh, dielectric uh, properties of the tissue strongly influences the way electromagnetic radiation is absorbed, producing signals. But it does have, like I mentioned, a resolution limited by wavelength and a trade-off between resolution and penetration depth. Now, ultrasound imaging, of course, uh, we know well in this room, has a high resolution but limited contrast in, um, can, when it concerns tissue. Now, Using microwave-induced uh, thermoacoustics, we hope to combine these two advantages to have a, a system that can uh, measure tissue, but also uh, at some standoff distance, uh, non-contact. Now, microwave-induced uh, thermoacoustic imaging, of course, is governed here by the thermoacoustic wave equation relating the pressure P with some heating function Q. In the case of the microwave-induced technique, as opposed to probably a more familiar photoacoustic technique, we just use some, you know, broadband microwave excitation in the RF frequency range, a couple gigahertz, uh, to generate stress waves uh, from the heating and absorption of that microwave power at uh, dielectric tissue interfaces that have contrast. So first, uh, some microwave excitation would hit a, um, maybe a, some abnormal tissue with dielectric contrast to the surrounding healthy tissue and cause differential heating and expansion in those two uh, and that differential heating and expansion then causes some pressure wave uh, at ultrasound frequencies that can then propagate out through the air tissue interface uh, through the air to a uh, detector at a standoff. Now, the, one of the critical challenges for non-contact detection becomes the acoustic impedance mismatch between uh, human tissue and air, or really any lossy media and air, uh, where we see a, a 65 dB acoustic interface uh, at that air tissue boundary. Now, that means we're detecting very small pressures uh, that have been attenuated by that boundary. Uh, we do that with uh, airborne CMOTs. Now, CMOTs is, again, probably familiar in this room, but it measures capacitance changes on a thin vibrating plate. Now, that plate has a very low mechanical impedance, which makes it well matched to air and gives us a very high sensitivity. Uh, the devices we use, shown here in the top right, uh, mounted into a package that we use in our system, uh, are vented to air through the substrate uh, which also produces some squeeze film damping effects that increase the bandwidth to make it a little more useful for imaging uh, as opposed to simple detection. Now, we have previously shown uh, devices uh, here characterized. You see the frequency response is around 72 kilohertz center frequency, and that's something we use in the rest of this talk here. But we've shown them with 1.3 picometer minimum detectable displacement uh, at the face of the device, that thin vibrating plate, which corresponds to 240 micropascals of pressure a uh, very sensitive device that we can use to pick up even the attenuated signals from that 65 dB interface loss. Uh, they are around 3.5% bandwidth, which for an imaging application is quite, quite low. Uh, but in these, in these devices, the bandwidth and sensitivity directly trade off with one another, uh, and we do not have a, uh, a single element that you could be considered uh, ideal for imaging right away, given those bandwidth and resolution uh, constraints. So, Using the device that we have, we do a detection experiment shown here where we have a, a agar tissue phantom that we have uh, mixed to match the uh, 
both the dielectric and acoustic properties of soft tissue, such as muscle or fat. We pour it into a plexiglass container with one open face. We allow it to set into a gel with some target embedded. The target will be some low loss, low dielectric material that produces uh, contrast at the interface. Uh, then we have a open-faced waveguide that brings our microwave excitation and RF frequency ranges. Uh, it's typically, we load it with some dielectric powder to match to the high uh, low dielectric load target that we're putting uh, there at the face of the waveguide that then couples the electromagnetic power into the interface between the target and the agar tissue phantom. And that target is uh, normal to the opening of the box and to the receiver CMOT mounted to some PCB board with receiving electronics. Uh, again, at some standoff there, giving non-contact uh, reception of the ultrasound signal uh, and non-contact excitation from the waveguide. So we have some experimental results here using that setup I just described. There's a few more dimensions noted on the figure if you are curious. And the input power we're using is around 5 watts average power and 1.7 kilowatts peak. Uh, but we have here, I've windowed out the uh, excitation and the, uh, the waiting time for the pulse to arrive, but the arrow here represents the onset of the signal that corresponds to the range delay from the transducer at a standoff uh, to that target face. Um, now here, you see after the onset of the pulse, there are acoustic multipath and other reverberations that come from the uh, geometry of our, our setup here, the plexiglass container. Uh, multiple paths for the ultrasound to travel around. But if you look at that, uh, the first onset of that main pulse, it has poor resolution anyways. Uh, as I mentioned before, the low bandwidth of the devices from the trade-off with the sensitivity would require to perform the detection at all. Now, kind of the traditional um, definition of bandwidth uh, does relate the minimum detectable uh, resolution delta R uh, with through the speed of sound to the bandwidth. Um, and as our low bandwidth devices yield uh, poor image resolution. Now, before we have some better optimized device that can act as an element in its own right, we come up with a synthetic solution uh, to access multi-frequency devices, multiple CMOTs with multiple excitations to recover some spectral information as an SFCW techniques, where we can then try to resolve the time domain signal through some inverse FFT, for example, uh, doing coherent processing. And we've done some theoretical work and some simulations to show that with n frequencies, we can resolve the time delay to n minus 1 interfaces, each producing their own thermoacoustic signals. So imagine in the setup we showed before, even with that simple one target, we have two interfaces producing signal, one at the front, one at the back. And with multiple excitations from multiple CMOTs with different operating frequencies, uh, we're able to um, do some you know, SFCW multi-frequency radar techniques to uh, synthesize the location of both of those interfaces. And to that end, we fabricated several other devices. Here again, we're showing the characterizations that were done with a lin linear Doppler vibrometer. And then we also did some pitch catch measurements using pairs of devices to come up with the minimum detectable pressures and displacements. And again, perform the same signal. As you can see here, the sensitivities of these devices are slightly different, but they were able to detect um, the thermoacoustic signal coming out of our setup shown before with the same multipath and reverberations, uh, and, you know, kind of showing the, the poor resolution of these devices. Now, in order to use the phase information that we collect from these multiple devices, as you see here in the top right, we want to take the spectra of the received signal and read off the phase at the, the various uh, center frequencies of each, de each device. In order to do that, we need stable phase information. So we performed several experiments first in the bottom left here. Uh, this scale is 0 to 360 degrees, showing one full 2 pi interval. And those traces represent uh, hundreds, thousands of measurements uh, over the course of several hours in the lab from one stationary target, say this diagram here, the interface with the bottom of a container with the RF excitation launched uh, immediately in line with the uh, transducer. Now, that shows that a total of about 14 degree variation corresponding here to 184 micrometers uh, of error of measured from our setup, including all of the triggers and you know, the various phase delay and the measurement components uh, kind of characterizes the sensitivity to phase of our whole system. And then again, just to confirm that that phase information was coming from some associated delay with an interface that was creating a thermoacoustic signal, we then put it on a linear stage and swept it down and back through uh, several 
positions uh, with a very accurate linear stage that we could measure the precise distance and then compare each of those measured points on the bottom right in red with Erebor corresponding to that 14 degree variation and compared it to the uh, expected phase from the delay associated with those distance changes. Now having all of that, we'd like to perform a lab demonstration to show uh, the uh, actual, you know, uh, actual results um, using that phase information to detect something. Now we have two frequencies available in our lab setup, so we cannot measure the front and back of that one target at the moment, but say we can measure uh, one interface. There is also another problem of unknown position errors between our various receivers and the CMOTs, and to get rid of those, we either need some kind of very accurate uh, measurement capabilities, or probably more likely what we'll do is fabricate an array of devices uh, all together on the same chip to have the same distance. Now, as a proxy for not having any of that, we instead measure twice two locations that have some unknown position error, but it's the same at each stage, measured again, mounted onto an accurate linear stage. So each result gives us some biased delay measurement to the one interface we're trying to measure. Now, if we take both of those, they haven't been moved by an accurate five centimeter offset, uh, we hope to resolve that five centimeters. So we performed this experiment with the 72 kilohertz and 106 kilohertz center frequency devices. Again, around three centimeters bandwidth, which gives them, for instance, you know, greater than 10 centimeters, almost 40 centimeters of resolution in the traditional sense. But with uh, a microwave excitation of 10 pulses at the 1.7 kilowatts peak power, averaged a thousand times, we're able to collect sufficient information, process it with you know, the SFCW techniques uh, you may be familiar with out in the literature and found a 2% error in the calculation of that five centimeter uh, fixed displacement that we had programmed into our measurement setup. So with all those things, we've kind of shown our multi-frequency resolution uh, is um, measurement techniques are possible to improve on that traditional bandwidth through synthetic means. So we have microwave induced thermoacoustic signals created at dielectric contrast interfaces, high sensitivity CMOTs to detect them, they can be future optimized to be imaging elements in their own right, but having multiple center frequencies, we can do SFCW and multi-frequency radar techniques to uh, improve on the resolution even going forward. So uh, thank you very much for your time.